it's fun listening to the kids go to children's church. It'd be nice if people were that enthusiastic about coming to adult church, I guess. But um, it might be the, <laughs> oh man, they say, all right. Uh, great, to, great to be with you guys. Um, I love the sermon series that we're doing, um, Everyday Faith. Um, if you haven't had a chance to listen to the first sermon in the series, it was about name and ser- uh, servant. Go back and listen to that uh, sermon. There's been some, uh, some great messages throughout this. Just taking a look at what does it mean to just be faithful in kind of everyday life and the stories that sometimes get missed um, as we're reading kind of some of the, the big stories in the Bible. As I was, uh, I've had the opportunity to travel quite a bit um, in the last few weeks. I try to take a look at it as an opportunity. Um, <laughs> But, it, but it's been for work. I um, was in the Philippines uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, what God is doing there through the NAB is really amazing. Um, uh, churches that have been planted decades ago that are still thriving and doing new ministry um, and uh, our ongoing uh, connection with, uh, with the Beekel Center there, which is the, a training center for pastors and for uh, church leaders. Uh, then I just came back this past week from a trip to, uh, to Romania and Hungary, where I met with our partners that are Romanian and Hungarian, uh, as well as a refugee from uh, Ukraine who's doing ministry from Hungary with our partners there back into Ukraine. Uh, thank you for your uh, support of that ministry and uh, just for your support of North American Baptist Missions. Um, God, is, uh, God is moving and doing things. And it's really beautiful, and I would love to tell you more and more stories about that. Um, but I'm, I'm supposed to preach today um, about a guy named Joseph, and the reason that I told you about where I've been is that um, I've been on uh, three different continents, including uh, North America, and um, have talked to people from five or six different countries. If you include Wisconsin as it's kind of its own country, um, maybe even seven. And, um, and, I, I, and I realized how excited I am to be preaching um, and love preaching back at, at, back at Faith. It's just such a privilege having pastored here um, for 12 years, being gone for seven and now being back and having the opportunity to be here. And I, because when people are asking me about what I'm excited about, I, I told people on all these different places that I'm excited that in a couple of weeks or a few weeks or then just a week that um, I'm going to be preaching um, back at, at Faith. And they would ask, what are you going to be preaching about? And I said, Joseph. And almost unanimously, they all went to Joseph from Genesis the coat of many colors, right? If you hear the sermon is going to be about Joseph, it's just kind of where our mind goes. There were a couple people who kind of hedged their bets and they said, which Joseph? And I said, well, which one do you think? And they're like, no, which one is it? And, um, and so while some people, you know, at least recognize that there was a couple, um, almost unanimously, they all, they all thought it was Joseph from the Old Testament, which I think speaks into... <laughs> what this sermon series is about and why we're taking a look at Joseph. He's almost a forgotten individual in the Bible. I remember growing up as a, as a young child, um, I still remember sitting in, uh, in our small kitchen on the farm and my dad was combing my hair and the way he would comb my hair would be to grab, I used to have hair and a lot of it and um, he would grab my chin and then he would like run this comb like through the snarls in my hair and, uh, and kind of ripped through, <laughs> through them. And the pastor was coming over for lunch, and he says, now remember, Carrie, you need to be an angel today. And I was like, Dad, I don't have to be an angel anymore. I'm a shepherd now, because it was almost Christmas time. And as a boy, I didn't want to be an angel. I wanted to be a shepherd. And then when you kind of graduate from being the shepherd, I wanted to go from being the shepherd to being King Herod which was my greatest role at the Venturia Baptist Church Christmas pageants. I got to be King Herod. Like, nobody wants to be Joseph. Like, he doesn't have a speaking part. He just stands there and looks, and that's it. Who wants to be Joseph? But that's who we're taking a look at today. So if you have a Bible, or if you want to grab one of the pew Bibles, we're going to be taking a look at the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. And uh, we'll be taking a look at... I didn't even write it down. And I need glasses. I'm kidding. This is just awful.
the Ma- uh, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. If you're using one of the Pew Bibles, it's on page 807, um, verses, uh, beginning with verse 18. If you would stand with me as we read the text for today. We believe that uh, Matthew, one of the followers of Jesus, um, wrote down these words nearly 2,000 years ago. We believe that the same Holy Spirit that inspired Matthew to write the words is the same Holy Spirit that even now is with us as we read them. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would add your blessing to the reading and the proclamation of your word today. Father, we pray that that which is true would take root in our lives so that we would become more like the image of your son, Jesus Christ, so that a world that so desperately needs to see a loving God would see you living in and through us. Father, if any word by mistake is spoken in untruth, we pray that you would quickly remove it from us. But again, that which is true, may it change us, may it transform us, may it shape us into the image of your Son in whose powerful name we pray all these things. Amen. You may be seated. Who was Joseph? In some ways, it's, it's hard to say. There's, there's not a lot um, in the Bible about Joseph. Um, the name Joseph is used 251 times in the Bible, only 36 times in the New Testament. And less than half of those refer to Joseph, the husband of Mary, the earthly adoptive father of Jesus. It's actually pretty easy to go through all the references. We have the reference that we just read in a few verses earlier in Matthew chapter 1 verse 6, there's a genealogy of Jesus listing his parentage. And Joseph by his his name is listed there. And then we have the visitation of the angel that we just read in Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 2, we have the story of the Magi coming to see Jesus and following the star, coming to the house where Mary and Joseph are and the baby Jesus And we have that story where the Magi are told that they shouldn't go back to tell Herod um, where where Jesus is because Herod has a plan to kill this, uh, this new king that he's heard about. And an angel of the Lord comes again to Joseph in a dream and tells Joseph to go to Egypt with Joseph, with Mary and Jesus. And so he does. And then later in the same chapter, after Herod is dead, the Lord comes to Jesus or to Joseph again and tells him to return back to Nazareth. We know that um, from a reference in the Gospel of Matthew as well as elsewhere that Joseph is a carpenter. The word that uh, we translate carpenter basically means uh, kind of someone, a tradesman, if you will. He probably did work with wood, but he probably also worked with stone and with other materials as well. The area where Jesus was raised, there aren't a whole lot of trees. And so more than likely, Joseph was more than just a carpenter, but a tradesman, um, building with stone and with wood and with other materials. That's what we have from the Gospel of Matthew. Mark, which is the earliest gospel, has nothing to say about Joseph at all. Um, It doesn't even refer to him, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. In Luke, Joseph is just simply mentioned as the one that Mary is betrothed to, as the angel of the Lord comes to Mary and tells her that she will bear Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 2, verse 4, we're told that Joseph and Mary go to Bethlehem to pay taxes. Later, we find out that Joseph and Mary and the baby are there in the stable as the shepherds come, and they find Joseph and Mary there. We don't hear Joseph's name, but, but Joseph and Mary take Jesus to the temple 
um, to dedicate him. And then later, they're back at the temple, and Jesus runs off and is talking with the religious leaders. And Joseph and Mary, along with the family, start going home. And a couple days later, they realize that Jesus isn't with them. And they run back to the temple, and there they find Jesus talking with the religious leaders. And they questioned Jesus, what he was doing there. And he said that he needed to be about his father's business, not carpentry, but his heavenly father. Again, Joseph's name isn't even mentioned there. In Luke and John, then in a couple of places, there's this question by the crowds, is this not Joseph's son? And Philip telling Nathaniel that they have found the Messiah and that he is Jesus, the son of a carpenter, Joseph. This is about all we know about Joseph. It's not a lot. he seems to be practically forgotten. When we ask how is Joseph viewed during his lifetime, it's difficult to even kind of get our heads wrapped around it because nobody nobody seems to talk about him. There are zero references about Joseph outside of the Gospels. None of the epistles say anything about Joseph. They don't even refer to the, the earthly father of Jesus. Not only is his name not mentioned, but he's not even referenced in any capacity. He seems to be forgotten. Mark, as we mentioned, the the first gospel to be written, doesn't mention Joseph at all. Matter of fact, it doesn't even refer to Joseph. Matter of fact, when, when Jesus is confronted by a crowd in Capernaum, they ask the question, is this not Mary's son? They don't refer to Jesus as the son of Joseph. They don't even refer to him the way they refer to him in Matthew, which is this not the carpenter's son, the son of Mary. They simply say, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Mark makes no reference of him. And this comment by the crowd, at least according to some scholars, one, a man named James Edwards in his commentary on the gospel of Mark says that this is a slight towards Jesus. That you wouldn't refer to a Jewish individual as the son of a woman, of a mother. But this is to question Jesus' legitimacy. That, that he is an illegitimate child. Matter of fact, there are some that believe that Mark, who tells this, Matthew, who tells the same story, then changes, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, to is this not the carpenter's son, the son of Mary, in order to soften Mark's gospel. This is a slight. This this reality of who Jesus was followed Joseph as it followed Jesus. At best, it seems that what we can say about Joseph in the Gospels, how he was viewed during his life was that he was a nice guy. But by earthly standards, not really a winner. Not the type of guy that's memorable that you write epistles about or that you write stories about. It seems that for the most part, nice guys are not winners. Nice guys just simply are losers and fade into the background. So what is Joseph's legacy? What is to be remembered of him today as we think about his story, if this is the way he was remembered during his life? I think as we read this story and as we think about the the rest of the context around Joseph, I want to argue that when we think about his legacy, that there's, there's three attributes to consider. The first one is mentioned directly in the text from today. The second one I think we can deduce from uh, these different stories that we can piece together. And the, the third one is implied heavily. The first one which is mentioned in the story is that Joseph was a just man. Another way to translate that word is that he was a a righteous man. Uh, If you're using the NIV, I think it talks about that uh, in relationship to the law, he was an outstanding or upstanding individual. The the word means here that uh, that Joseph was the type of guy that um, he followed through on his vows. That Joseph was the type of guy that before uh, before humanity, before men and women, and before God, um, he was a good guy, an upstanding individual. 
I think that's an attribute that's obvious of Joseph. And again, it's explicitly stated in our text. The second attribute is that I would say that Joseph was an individual who was perplexed, who was at times confused. Um, I, I, we see that in the, the story as, uh, even in this story, uh, when the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph and tells him this, I would imagine that there's a piece of Joseph in the back of his mind going, say what? When Mary and Joseph dedicate Jesus in the temple, it says that they are both bewildered by the things that are said about Jesus. When Mary and Joseph go back to the temple to find Jesus, and there he is talking to the religious leaders, and they say, Jesus, what are you doing? And Jesus says, I had to be about my father's business. It says that they were perplexed, confused. I think that there must have been times in Joseph's life where he thought, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. I would imagine that even in, even in Joseph's engagement and leading up to marrying Mary, he had a vision of what marriage was going to look like. He had a vision of what life with Mary was going to look like. That was changed forever. I would imagine that Joseph had some idea or some thought, some dream, some hopes of what it was going to be like to have a son, to love him and to be loved by him. But the way Joseph thought about it wasn't, wasn't the way it happened. And I think there must have been times in Joseph's life where he looked back and must have thought to himself, did I hear this right? Is this, is this really the way it's supposed to be? I... <laughs> Before you think that I'm being too hard on Joseph or that, that Joseph probably didn't think those things, we need to remember that in the Gospel of Mark chapter 3 that even Mary thought Jesus was out of his mind. There must have been times in Joseph's life where he thought, this is not the way marriage was supposed to be. This is not the way my life was supposed to work out. This is not what it was like or supposed to be like to have a son. I think that there were times in Joseph's life that he was perplexed, that he was confused, that he must have thrown up his hands towards God and said, why? Why this way? But the third attribute that we know about Joseph is that Joseph was faithful, that he was obedient, that despite his confusion, despite his questions, despite being perplexed, he was faithful to God. He was faithful to what God asked of him and called him to do. I think he was able to be faithful because, because of the first attribute, because he was just and righteous, because he had been well formed in the way of God, in the way of scripture, because of his love and his commitment to God even when confusion came, even when he was perplexed, even when he threw up his arms and must have cried out, why? He was able to be and remain faithful because he was just and righteous because he had placed his hope and his faith in Yahweh, in God. This is who Joseph was. This is his legacy, that he is just and righteous. And though he was confused and perplexed, he remained faithful. Though life didn't always turn out the way he had hoped, he remained obedient. And so there's a temptation at this point in the message. There's a temptation at this point in the sermon. And the temptation is this, be like Joseph. And there are a lot of sermons that are preached that way. There's a lot of Sunday school lessons that are taught that way. There's a lot of children's songs that talk about daring to be a Daniel. And so there's a temptation to say, be like Joseph. But I think if Joseph was here today, I think Joseph would be like, no, no, no. No. That is not the point of this text. That is not the point of my story. It is not the legacy of my life. 
His legacy is that he pointed to Christ. His legacy is that he died to his own ambitions, that he died to his own dreams, that he died to his own preferences. His legacy is that he stood in awe of Jesus. His legacy is that he stood in awe of Yahweh, the God of Israel, who in the second person came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. That is his legacy. His legacy is that he answered God's call. He answered God's call to be forgotten so that God would be remembered. His legacy was to answer God's call to be a nice guy. His legacy was to answer God's call to be, at least by the standards of the world, a loser. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian who was killed by the Nazis, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. The legacy, the legacy of Joseph is that he answered the call to come and die to be forgotten. And God calls us to do the same. God calls us to come and to be a nice guy. God calls us to come and to be a loser, at least by the standards of the world. God calls us to come and die. Christ bids us come, come and die. Put to death our preferences. Put to death our dreams that are outside of his will. Put to death our rights. Put to death the way we thought everything should turn out and to live faithfully in the way things are. Knowing that even in the most difficult of circumstances that he is with us and that when we mourn, he mourns with us. And when we rejoice, he rejoices with us. I fear that we've created a Christianity in the West that points more to Herod than it does to Christ. We don't want to be Joseph, if we're honest. We don't want to be the nice guy. We want to win. And we want to win at all costs. But this is not what we're called to do. Joseph was a nice guy because Christ was a nice guy. A loser. This is the way of Christ. You see, Christ took my sin and my sorrow and bore them to Calvary. He suffered and he died for me. This, this is our king. This is who Paul says we preach. Not Christ resurrected. Not Christ coming back triumphant. Although we believe those things and hold on to those things with hope, Paul says we preach Christ crucified. That, that is who we are. That is who we serve. That is who we point to. That is the legacy of Joseph, and that is to be our legacy as well. Jesus, Jesus is the ultimate nice guy. He's the ultimate loser. And he calls us to be the same. I, um, <clears throat> I want to invite up on the platform two of my favorite losers in the last couple of weeks. Uh, ben and Amy Sanquist, um, if you guys would come up. And I, I just have to tell you that as I look out, I see a whole congregation of losers. Um, that it's not just simply Ben and Amy. I, these stories could be told about the Vandeglins or the Hattins or the Corkies. You guys are such losers to do what you guys do every week with Awana. Like, I can't even sit through the Awana meal without going, my head is going to explode and run for the door. There are stories of losers in this church. But in the last couple of weeks, there's a story of these two losers that, um, that I, I just think is worth sharing. A couple of weeks ago, you guys were in Sacramento. Um, tell us, kind of, what, what were you guys doing there? Uh, so three weeks ago today, we were in the middle of our first Ironman triathlon. Uh, we were on the bikes at this point. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, an Ironman is 
a 2.4 mile swim, a 112 mile bike, and a 26.2 mile run, all on the same day. Um, yeah. Great, and how did you guys envision it going? Sure, um, yeah, so, you know, I kind of wrote the training plan and built it based on some goals, and uh, we, we wanted to do all the training together and then race together as well, and uh, the swim went faster than expected. We wanted to do, like, a little less than an hour on the swim. It was 40-something, 40 48 minutes. We wanted to do seven-ish, seven to eight hours on a bike. It was, like, 648 or something. And then we wanted to do like five-ish hours on the run, and the run was like six and a half, or six, almost seven hours. So what, what happened on the run? What changed the circumstances? Um, I became the biggest loser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my body just really started to break down. Um, Amy was really stronger than me the whole day, and it, it just all came to a head at about mile six. I couldn't eat anymore, and I couldn't really run. Um, every time I tried to run, it just, my body said no. So we ended up doing a lot of walking in the last 20 miles. All right. Amy, when uh, you guys shared the story and I heard it, you talked a little bit about um, kind of sticking with Ben kind of through that, and you talked about the why in that. Could you share that? Yeah. Um, so during, I, I did, I felt good. Um, I've, I've run a few marathons, so I felt like I was sort of hitting my stride at that point. Um, there's a, a funny picture um, that was captured of, of, uh, of us at about mile six, and Ben's like whole body is like strained. All of his neck muscles are strained, and I'm like, my ponytail is flapping, and it's like super <laughs> fresh, and um, it's really, um, a, I love it, because it's like a picture of sort of what was happening in the moment, um, and during our training, um, a lot of the stuff that we did, it felt like Ben was sort of coming to my level, um, he's definitely a lot stronger in the short stuff. Um, and so he, it felt like was sort of coming to my level during the training. Um, and so it was, it was an opportunity for me in that moment to come to him. Um, he said a couple of times, like, you should go ahead, you should go without me. Um, and I just was like, no, like the entire purpose of why we were doing this was to do it together and to stay together. And so, um, I, I just, I felt like it was a really a uh, cool opportunity um, for me to be able to uh, to step back and come alongside of him. Cool, thanks. Ben, anything you want to add? Yes. Um, yeah, so you talked about kind of less told stories when you talk about Joseph in this whole series. And I think that one of the lesser told stories is Genesis 2. Uh, we so often focus in marriage and in life on Genesis 3, the fall, all the bad stuff that happens after that. But in Genesis 2, they work together mm. in communion with God. And there's a whole lot of imagination, because it's like one sentence <laughs> that you have to think about. But um, in that moment, uh, uh, we're, they held fast to each other. Uh, he held fast to his wife, and she held fast to me. Uh, they shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Um, I offered the fruit many times, I, or a couple times at least. I said, um, go ahead, go without me. And uh, Amy did not bite. She uh, saw me naked and was not ashamed. Uh, I was stripped down. And she just stuck with me and, you know, paging forward, I read this into that. Um, it says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only, uh, 
messing up. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count it equal, something to grasp, but gave that up. So, yeah, that's, that's the story that I like to tell. Um, the rest about being a loser is a little harder. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. I think it's, uh, I think that there's an irony in Ben saying that, uh, that he's the biggest loser in that story. The reality is that the way the world looks at things, Amy is the loser. That she didn't run ahead. That she didn't finish with her best time. Um, but this is what God calls us to do. To come alongside those who are weak, those who are broken. To point towards Christ in the everyday things of our lives. There is a way in which one could look at what Ben and Amy do and say, well, it was just a, it was just a race. <laughs> it's not just a race, it's an Iron Man. But still, at the same time, it's just a race. What's the eternal significance of it? But we need to have eyes to see Jesus. We need eyes to be able to see Jesus in this story, in the way they train together, in the way they sacrifice together, in the way that they did not give up in the middle of, of circumstances looking very different than what they had hoped or thought that they would be. It's an illustration. It's a sermon, if you will, of what God calls us to do. We need to have eyes to see Jesus in those moments of everyday life, of those around us. Because if we don't see him, it's hard to stand amazed at him. If we don't see him, it's hard to stand amazed in his presence. If we don't look for him, we won't see him. If we don't look for him, we will not see how marvelous he really is. If we don't take time to see him, it's so much harder to point to him, to live like him. That is the gift of Joseph. That is the legacy of Joseph. If we don't look for Christ, if we don't see him, we won't hear his call. Come, Come be a nice guy in order to reflect the glory of God. Come be a loser to win the greatest prize that one could ever hope for. Come, come and die to live with Christ forever. Come. Come stand in the marvelous presence of Jesus Christ and sing of his glory forever and ever. Oh, how wonderful. Oh, how marvelous. Come. Come. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. Father, we thank you for a man like Joseph for people like Joseph, for people like Joseph and Mary. If you would make a, a list of the, of the least significant people in Nazareth in the first century, Joseph and Mary wouldn't even make the list because they would just simply be forgotten and overlooked. But you call them. You use them. Father, thank you that they answered your call. Thank you that they pointed towards you. Thank you that their legacy is not about them, but their legacy is about you. Thank you that Joseph is forgotten so that your son can be remembered. Father, we pray that we would hear, that we would hear your call. Come. Come, be a nice guy. Come, be a loser by the standards of the world. Come, come and die in order that we can reveal your marvelous glory. In order that we can receive the prize, as Paul says, that will never tarnish and never be taken away. And so that we can have life everlasting with you. Father, if there's any here today that don't understand what that means or have never heard that story, God, I just pray that they would come and 
talk to Pastor Aaron or myself or one of the individuals on the prayer team after the service and ask, what does it mean to have forgiveness from sin? What does it mean to have freedom from guilt? What does it mean to have the promise of life everlasting with the Father who loves us so that we can stand in your presence forever singing of your glorious and wonderful person? We pray this in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.